Hello, everyone. It is 11 a.m. UTC. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us again for day two um, of our PI14 convening. Uh, we had a great day yesterday, uh, lots of sessions. Today, it's a much slightly slower pace. We've got five sessions, each of them about an hour long, and we hope that you can all um, engage. Um, the meeting format for all our sessions today is, uh, is meeting, which means if at any point you have any questions or any comments, feel free to use a chat or raise your hand. Um, we'll be happy to, and the speakers, I'm sure, will be happy to have you engage. Uh, this morning, we'll begin with uh, the reference architecture um, and technical session. Um, we have Pedro, Adrian, Miguel, uh, Michael Richards, and Justice. So um, I'll pass it over to them. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Simeon. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, going to give a quick kind of intro and then hand over to Pedro to give you a bit of a uh, breakdown of exactly what we've been up to. Um, so for the last couple of PIs, uh, the, um, you know, we've, we've had, you know, the performance POC, we've been doing work on Tiger Beetle. Uh, we've done a lot of work on figuring out how we can support ISO 222. Uh, there's also been work on an FRMS solution. And, and what we've concluded from all of that is that there are some fundamental architectural changes uh, that we think we need to make to sort of modernize the module architecture, uh, prepare it for extensibility, um, make it easier for community contribution and independent contributions, uh, and so on. So at the end of the last PI, we agreed that we would have a reference architecture and feature baselining stream. Uh, and what we're going to present is the output of that stream today, as well as some conclusions on, on, on where we want to uh, on where we want to take this work. Um, so when we talk about uh, feature baselining, we the goal there was to sort of establish a baseline of which features we have and which features were um, missing that we know the uh, the market is looking for. Um, so this session is about the, the future architecture, about the reference architecture. Um, there's been a lot of people involved. It has not been easy. We've had some long sort of two, two and a half hour sessions. Um, not everyone who's presenting today, uh, or at least not everyone who's been involved is presenting today. Um, so thanks to everyone else who, who has been involved and, and is not part of this presentation. Um, it's been a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. So, you know, please don't assume that, you know, we've just threw this all together for the presentation. This is, this is the outcome. You kind of seen the tip of the iceberg. That's, there's been a lot of work that has, has gone into getting us here and still, um, you know, quite a lot of work to do. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Pedro um, and let him give you a background on exactly you know, what the reference architecture is and, and how we've gotten to this point. Thanks, Adrian. So what is, what is um, a reference architecture and, and how does it help? Why do we need one? In, a, in its most simple form, a, a reference architecture is a set of documents that capture the essence of the product and provide guidance to the implementation of its future vision. It identifies abstractions, interfaces, and standardization opportunities. It proposes solution patterns to, to common problems so that we don't have to solve them multiple different times. It helps enforcing technical design principles. It provides guidance to the actual implementation architecture, which is a different sense from the reference architecture. And it also forced, fosters innovation and contribution by defining what can be done and how those things can be done. And, and this is the extensibility part. This diagram shows where a reference architecture is, is placed um, and, and how it must incorporate and understand not only the vision um, and the principles that drive the product and, and, and our platform, but also the requirements, the previous experience, and even closer to the technical innovation that, that, that must happen. Um, this is a living document. It must be kept up to date. Um, however, we never end up fully implementing that vision, that future reference architecture. It never gets implemented. It's, it's always a, a target that we are constantly updating, um, and it should always reflect the desired future state. The most relevant benefit of having a future reference architecture is, is that it facilitates decision making um, about how we can deliver some features we're asked to deliver. Um, we, we need information to better decide, decide if a certain feature 
should be delivered, for example, as quickly as possible? Um, does it need a bit more thinking or does it even need some of fundamental changes in the structure that we have so that, uh, and, and those changes might affect the core components. So what is important is that this future reference architecture um, also allows that decision-making process to be a bit more informed. What, what, what we did to produce this. So producing a useful reference architecture requires a lot of homework, as Adrian was saying. This, there was a lot of discussion. Um, we resorted to domain-driven design advice for this work. First, we, did, we, we worked on getting a solid understanding of the problems we're solving um, and their relative importance to each other. Um, this is a painful exercise and, and it, it's usually like this. Yeah? It involves a lot of people talking about things everyone thinks we have um, fully understood and agreed um, and, and, and until we discover that that is not the case, that there's a lot of discussions that still need to happen until we get there. Um, then we arrange those problems into cohesive sets of solutions where related problems are solved together. Um, this arrangement is then the basis for that future solution. Only then we start working on the actual reference architecture on the technical stuff. These are the problems that we have identified as essential to solve so that Moduloop can deliver its value. Um, in DDD terms, in domain-driven design terms, these are known as the core problems. Uh, the, these are the ones that we need to solve ourselves and control the outcome. In practical terms, this is where we need to put the most effort. Examples of core problems include the transfers, the account ledger, and then the participant um, lifecycle, for example. We have also identified other problems we need to solve. These are the things that we, we still must solve them, uh, but they are not where we should put the biggest effort. Um, again, using DDD terms, there's two ways to classify these other problems. On the right side, we have the generic problems. Um, and, and these are the, usually the things that can be solved by using off-the-shelf so off software requiring only some integration effort. Yeah? Examples of this are authentication or platform monitoring. We don't need to code these solutions ourselves. We can use something that's existing already. On the left side, we have what DDD calls the supporting problems. Um, and these are the problems that can can't be easily solved by using off-the-shelf software. Um, we need some level of coding effort to solve them. And it's not just integration. Examples of this are authorization or access policies or reporting. So, this exercise allowed, it, allowed us to understand exactly what we needed to solve and, and what are the priorities, where should we put our time and, and, and effort. So knowing these problems and identifying them, then we created this map. Um, we don't expect you to be able to read all of the detail, but this, this in DDD terms, the context map um, that we're seeing in this representation is how we can solve the problems we set out to solve in cohesive groups called bounded contexts. These bounded contexts are boundaries that encapsulate similar functionality and business rules that must be implemented together. So after arranging these bounded contexts, here presented by those big blocks, we mapped out the nature of their relationship between each other. Essentially, this allows us to understand which parts of the system need information or functionality from other parts, and what is the nature of that dependency? One immediate benefit is that we understand which are the major dependencies and also what are the most critical parts of the system. Another benefit of this view of this context map is, to, uh, is the ability to quickly understand the impacts of a change in any of the parts. Of course, this doesn't look much like the structure we have in module loop today. So we proceeded to the gap identification. We have, based on this map, we have tagged all the bounded contexts and all of the features that we're trying to solve with one of these four tags. The first one is, is, is a certain path of this um, ideal system missing in the current implementation. Um, another, another one, another gap is maybe it's not missing but it's not implemented in exactly the same way with the same separation of function and data um, of which we actually have several cases. There's also the case where a certain feature that we have mapped out is missing from the current implementation or it doesn't implement it exactly like that. Um, another aspect that we need to consider is 
Are there certain parts of the system on the critical path for performance and resiliency? In other words, which components must be very performant, scalable, and, and, and resilient? I know this, this is, again, this is really difficult to read. At the end, we will share links so that you can investigate this in detail. So some of the problems we have identified during the DDD sessions are of a general nature. And what we mean by this is cross-cutting. Essentially, these cross-cutting concerns, they don't belong in any of the specific areas that we've shown, but they must still be designed and implemented in a consistent way by the entire system to deliver value. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have time in this PI to dedicate too much to this area, but we will continue working on the reference architecture and include recommendations on how we address these concerns for the next platform version. Um, you can see that these are the problems like plat platform configuration, monitoring, security, auditing. These are very important problems that we need to solve um, and we need to solve in a centralized way so that everything can benefit from this value. As mentioned in the beginning, a reference architecture must be detailed enough to have value and deliver it, but not too detailed to actually limit the actual implementation. Um, we have agreed during this exercise that the right level of abstraction is the bounded context or the yellow boxes that we've shown in the previous slide. This also has in consideration the single responsibility principle and the decoupling of the core subsystems. As such, the most important aspect of this design is to identify the interfaces between those core subsystems, those yellow boxes. By having well-defined and stable interfaces, we achieve the promised decoupling, which enables us to evolve the parts independently and even replace them if, if we need to. As per our original design principles, the communication between parts of the platform should be mainly asynchronous and event-driven. Um, we have also agreed that some of the communication paths, which are potentially less critical or don't require absolute max performance, can be implemented in a much simpler remote procedure called RPC style. Of course, a reference architecture must also propose mechanisms to ensure the platform is secure, performant at scale, cost-effective, modular and extensible, resilient, testable, um, easy to deploy and easy to operate. Um, all of these things sound obvious, but it's really easy to affect negatively any of these aspects of these abilities with just the wrong technical term. So besides all these nice things that makes us, makes us want to have a, a reference architecture, there are specific benefits of the specific architecture design that we are proposing for the next version of Modular. On the technical side, the design we propose with its clear separation of concerns um, decouple components um, and, and stable interfaces will result in smaller code bases that address smaller problems and are easier to understand. Stable interfaces and the data hiding will permit extending the platform with more functionality by allowing contribution without the risk of breaking the core, the critical core of the component. Um, and all of the services must be testable, easy to deploy, and also easy to operate with um, enhanced approach to platform configuration, auditing, and monitoring. Of course, these are technical benefits. They are important, but they are not as important as the ones on this slide. We want to be able to avoid uh, dependent, depending on specific infrastructure components. Uh, we address this by having the right abstractions, like known software patterns that allow us to decouple infrastructure components from the valuable code that calls it. This, for example, allows us to mitigate issues and the impacts of license changes that happens, for example, like we have in Grafana. We'd like to have the ability to extend the platform by, having, by adding more functionalities without the need to change the core components or the need to access their data directly. This is the data hiding principle. Because of these stable interfaces and the data hiding principle, it should also possible, be possible to completely replace a component. This architecture allows us to provide also multiple external APIs besides FS, um, FSPI OP, where we can add ISO, for example, or even a synchronous API without changing the core of the platform. Ultimately, we'd like to provide the foundation for a true marketplace where anyone in the community can contribute by adding new features or replacing discrete components. In the next few slides, we will present some examples of how to do this. 
So with that, I'm passing to Adrian. Thanks, Pedro. Um, yeah, so, so I think a concrete example of what Pedro is talking about is the work we were attempting to do over the last PI, which was um, to, to find a way to integrate Tiger Beetle into Modulube. So we spent quite a lot of time uh, looking at the existing settlement um, uh, transfer processing uh, and, and the existing ledger databases. And the reality is that all of that functionality is very tightly coupled in the existing system. And, and it wasn't obvious how one could uh, slot in something like Tiger Beetle, which is you know, very specifically about uh, being a system of record for accounts and balances. That's, that's what it is. It's a, it's a database. It stores accounts and balances, processes, um, transfers for, for balance changes, but, but that's it. It's, it's business logic. It's internal business logic is purely about accounting. Uh, and so uh, you can bump onto the next slide. Uh, thanks, Pedro. And so, you know, what, what we recognized was that because I was participating in the DDD and, and reference architecture sessions, as well as working with our team at Coil on, on how this would work, um, that we needed to take a step back and, and that the, the right way to integrate Tiger Beetle into uh, Modulub was to do it uh, when the Modulub architecture was better suited. Uh, and so that immediately means we can start to think about just the interfaces into Tiger Beetle. If you think of Tiger Beetle as a core piece of infrastructure inside an accounts and balances bounded context. Uh, and so that would allow us to do that with you know, no side effects. We can say, um, let's take the component that exists today and just pull it out, put a new one in that respects all of those interfaces and contracts, um, but now it contains Tiger Beetle at its heart for whatever benefit that is, you know, that's going to bring to the system. Uh, so that's one, one concrete example. Uh, and I think, I, I forget who's next, we, we have a couple more, um, and I think it's uh, Miguel who's going to talk a bit about the work he's done on uh, the notifications. Uh, thanks, Adrian. So in uh, yesterday's Core OSS feedback session, you may recall that I covered some of the changes made to the reliable notification design, um, specifically in aligning it to the reference architecture design principles. Um, as such, these principles allow us to easily switch out different components to accommodate different transports and different payment, payment or API specifications. In this diagram, we have two bounded contexts, one for the notification engine and another for the FSP IFB specification, i.e. the ML API adapter. For the notification engine, we can easily swap or add new components to support different transports. In this example, we have both the uh, HTTP and gRPC transports uh, represented by two different command handlers and they are sending notifications to two different DFSBs and each of those DFSBs have their own respective transports. Um, for the FSB IOP bounded context, we have the ability to add or switch out um, the adapter to handle different incoming API specification requests such as ISO and handle the outgoing corresponding responses. And this can be done either synchronously or asynchronously. Um, if you want more detail on this, I recommend having a look at the reliable notification design where I cover both of these examples in more detail. Um, the only caveat is they are just examples and by no means is the, is the example for ISO the design for ISO. It's just purely an example of how they can be integrated. Oh, thanks. I think next is to Michael. We'll be talking a bit more about ISO. As soon as I unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much, Miguel. Um, so, yes, we talked a little bit about um, uh, ISO 2002 support in Mojloop, and we're going to be talking a whole lot more about it this afternoon. Uh, but one of the things, obviously, that we need to do uh, is to figure out a good way of integrating the ISO 2002 messages with the uh, Mojloop switch. Now, the problem that we have at the moment is that uh, because the switch was originally constructed for a single type of message, that type that message itself gets passed through the system uh, via the module loop adapter, as Miguel has said. What we need to be able to do 
uh, is to have a service-based architecture in which the processing components themselves, the ledgers, the transfer processing, the quotation processing, all of those things work in the same way and just use the information that they need uh, so that we can start uh, having different kinds of message which convert their information into the form needed by the underlying components um, and have an agnostic interface which enables, sorry, the underlying components have an agnostic interface, which enables them to, con, uh, to consume information from any type of message, provided obviously that that message contains the information that they require. And we'll be talking a bit about the way in which we uh, get that information later on this afternoon. But an example is, um, those of you who've been doing your homework on the Motion Lib current API will know that the way in which we specify an identifier in that is that we say what kind of identifier it is and then what value it has. So for instance, if I want to find out who owns a particular phone number, I'll send something that says, I'm looking for a phone number and the phone number is this. If we're looking for a bank account number, we will uh, send something that says, I'm looking for a bank account number and the bank account number is this. Now, ISO 20022 doesn't work like that. The identifiers are specified as um, uh, across as actual data items across the request. So there will be a place where the phone number is held, a place where the bank account number is held. So our adapter in this case will need to modify the incoming message so that it turns into whatever generic message identification scheme we eventually propose for, in this case, the discovery process. Uh, and now, in order to add a new kind of message content, we just need to add new adapters which will convert the content of the messages into the form the service is required and convert the output of the messages, as Miguel has just said, into the form that the message transmission service requires so that we can talk happily to people in different kinds of message context. Uh, could you move on, please, Pedro? Thank you very much. Uh, we also wanted to look at an example of adding a completely new area of functionality. Uh, and the example we picked was a dispute resolution module. So if we imagine that a contributor, who might even be one of yourselves, wants to add a dispute resolution module to Mojuloop, then what sorts of things might that module want to do. It might want to get information from the switch about the transactions or about the switch's understanding of the transactions that were in dispute. It might want to notify parties about the progress or resolution of a dispute. It might want to allow administrators, hub administrators, or indeed participant administrators to view the progress of disputes. And it might want to collect and store information of its own from parties to the dispute. Now, a reference architecture like this will provide clearly defined access routes, uh, defined by APIs to easily understood components. Part of the point of splitting things up in the way we've been talking about in this presentation is to provide components that have a, a clear functional purpose so that when you look at it, you can understand what it is supposed to do and how it's supposed to integrate with the others. We want to provide something that the contributor can interact with in a standard way uh, using APIs, uh, published APIs with uh, proper documentation so that they can see what's available in the system and understand where they need to add new stuff. Also, we want the contributor to understand how their contribution would fit in into a general architectural landscape. How do we component, how do we compartmentalize components? How do they communicate with each other? Those sorts of general statements about how things fit together are things that you should be a contributor, should be able to understand by looking at a reference architecture. We also need to provide clear rules of engagement and to publish functionality which other components can make use of. For instance, reporting services may want to use data on disputes. So they would be a customer of the new dispute resolution module. And as you developed the dispute resolution module, you would need to be working with 
the people who are in charge of the reporting module to make sure that you are providing the information that they require. So those are the sorts of areas that we think uh, will enable uh, contributors to engage much more readily and simply with the system than they can do at the moment. Situation at the moment, as I'm sure we've said, is that you have to know a great deal about Mojuloop in order to contribute to any of it. What we want to do is to replace that with an architecture where you only need to know about the bits of Mojuloop you will interact with in order to understand how to contribute productively uh, to the overall enterprise. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Justus, who is going to talk to us a bit about FRMS integration. Thanks, Michael. Um, so from our perspective, something that obviously interests us a lot is the ability to integrate with the Mojito platform. Um, the new work that is being done to drive more of an event-driven architecture helps us quite a bit because it creates a number of different opportunities for us to integrate to the platform without a invasive process. So we don't have to dig into the guts of Mojoloop to try and build a egress point to feed a transaction downstream into the fraud risk management solution. We can tap into one of numerous events that are available in the platform that are then exposed that we could attach a listener to and pick up the information at that point. So for example, in a transfer prepare requested event, we could then tap into that event and a financial crime risk listener can be provided um, on the Mojoloop side of the um, interface boundary to collect any additional data that we would require and then package a API call out to the fraud risk management solution. Um, we would then evaluate that request and we could then send an event back through the listener to say that we have completed the evaluation. We have the data. If uh, at your convenience, you can then come and collect the data from our data store accessing our own API. That creates a lot of abstraction and flexibility for us. So there are any of the events that are available or exposed in the Mojulu platform. For example, if a participant is being created, we could fire off a event that could be picked up by the fraud financial crime risk management platform to evaluate the participant. When a quote is being um, composed, we could pick up that event and then do a transaction monitoring service based on the data that is available at the time. We could also pick up any number of events throughout the life cycle of a transfer or a participant to connect to the fraud risk management platform, which offers a far more flexible approach than having to build a attachment point from the Mojulu perspective and then fire off a API request from inside the Mojulu platform. We're quite excited about the, the, the work that's being done around the event-driven architecture. Thank you very much. Now I think that's back to Miguel. So just quickly discussing how developers will, will contribute going forward. So with, with the DD aspects of the reference architecture, developers will only need to focus on the specific binary contexts that they are interested in. Um, it is still also likely that a developer may need to integrate with other contexts. However, detailed knowledge is probably not required since there are well-defined APIs and as a result, we expect this to vastly improve the developer's onboarding experience. It will also be easier for a developer to add new or extended existing functionality if we take into consideration the single responsibility principle for each context. This will allow a developer to clearly understand how and where functionality will be added, how it will be tested, and how it will impact, if any, existing components and functionality. The result being that a developer will be able to contribute much quicker. And overall, this will also support a healthier Mojave community. In the example on the right, it would be fairly easy for a developer to create a new notification command handler within the notification engine, within the notification bounded context, to integrate with Slack, thereby enabling things such as alerts with minimal side effects. Um, Back to Pedro. Thanks, guys. Um, OK, so these are really important benefits. Um, and these are very concrete benefits, besides the technical benefits that we've highlighted um, of 
and which include also the scalability, the cost effectiveness, and, and all of the nice things to have. Um, the question is, how do we get there? And, and we have an idea of a proposal to get there. So we propose a three-phase uh, approach spread over the next two PIs, minimizing the impact of breaking changes and realizing value as often as possible. W what does this all mean? So phase one is a short one. We'd like to complete the reference architecture. Uh, we have some artifacts already, some good details. We need to complete them. We'd like to produce a detailed implementation architecture and a plan for the next phase. Um, and, and this stage is really important. This is a crucial phase where we need to we need dedicated people. Uh, ideally, an intensive sprint format with at least um, two full days per week. Um, obviously, this needs to include all of the team that has been participating in these sessions already um, and anyone else willing to join. These sessions are of a somehow technical nature, but we benefit greatly by having a lot of other people that have a lot of experience besides purely technical stuff. Um, and this has been a premise of, of, of this exercise. At the end of this phase, we will have to confirm the detailed implementation architecture, obviously, um, and we will need to confirm a resource a plan for phase two. Phase two is about breaking everything that needs to be broken until the end of the PI 14. And this strategy reduces the impact of the typical never ending next generation branch problems where we go off and build everything on the side and then we never merge it back. Um, the point is we need to put all our efforts into changing things to produce those stable interfaces and put them in place as soon as possible. And, and this in turn reduces the delay for other developers that need to start working on the on, on other features that need the core interfaces to be to be ready. So a commitment to write tests and mocks very soon um, is, is important. Um, and this will facilitate that parallel development of other features that require the enhanced core components. Because by using those tests and those mocks and these stable interfaces, other developers are able to evolve their own features, assuming that the core components will have a certain shape, a certain interface, um, by just using those tests and those mocks. It's important to stress that this is not a rebuild. The main focus of this phase is to shift the overall architecture to its new structural form and implement those new interfaces. The existing functionality will not change. And in phase three, we'll have the ability to add functions to these new core services if needed. Cross-cutting concerns are somehow new um, in the way they are being shaped. And this phase will provide an initial implementation for those cross-cutting concerns. Again, focusing on getting stable interfaces and stable foundation to be available. Reliable, reliable notification is, is possibly the one example of a set of new features that has already been designed very much in line with this new architecture. And this can be built in parallel uh, during phase the, during this phase two. As, as for the other things that we have to deliver, uh, as soon as we have the complete reference architecture from phase one and the interface definition, we'll be able to make better decisions on how to deliver things like ISO 222, the interchange calculation, bulk processing, PISP integrations. If necessary, we can even build on top of the current version to facilitate getting features out that are very in, very critical and, and we need to deliver with a bit of an eye on how those things can align with the reference architecture so that they can easily be retrofitted in the future. Phase three is about consolidating and releasing a production ready version of, of this second version of the platform. Um, there are three main chunks of work. Uh, the first is to as, as finish up the core enhancements um, delivering the parts that were not foundational and delivered in phase two. Um, as, as you recall, phase, phase two was, was only about getting the interfaces, was doing the minimum as fast as possible so that the interfaces are, change, are, are changed and stable. So this is about fixing those things and making them production ready. It's also about delivering the cross-cutting concerns in full. Um, again, the first the phase two was about getting the interfaces ready and, and eventually some libraries. This in phase three is about getting it ready and production um, uh, good enough. 
um, and then taking the opportunity to migrate to version two, any of the other features that we had have decided to build in parallel on top of version two of the platform. So this is where things that were pressing of pressing nature that had to be built with on top of the current structure that we have can be migrated to version two of this so that we can release version two with all of the uh, bells and whistles. Um, during this phase, this phase three, we assume that these big chunks of work can be done in parallel from the start. So, so this is where we can have um, efficiencies and, and, and collaborate on it. Now, foundational work um, should be built as a collaborative effort uh, with multi-vendor teams. Um, this strategy will not only get us faster, um, but also promote a healthy marketplace-like environment where everyone feels that they can work on anything and be part of the whole. Um, in our view, this can only enrich the Modulo platform and its community. Um, it, it is really important to stress out this, this aspect. The work that has been done so far has been an incredible teamwork with a lot of people participating in these sessions. They have not been easy sessions. They have been very uh, stressful sessions at times, uh, but we have progressed with a lot of agreements and a very solid foundation on which to continue working. Um, we would really like this to continue in the future with this collaborative environment in mind so that we get to the point where this version two of the platform allows everyone to start extending and contributing to the marketplace. With that, we open the floor for questions. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of those. And thank you for your time. Um, thank you, guys. We do have some extra a few minutes here. So um, if there are any questions, please uh, raise your hand up. We'll give you the opportunity to speak um, or post them in the chat. Yeah, I apologize, but then I'm not monitoring the other thing. I'm monitoring Zoom only. So, Yeah, I'm looking at the other. There, there are no questions yet. I mean, we did leave. We did intentionally leave a lot of time for questions. So please do, uh, yeah, please do give us some more. Some no, I'll tell you. I... I, you know, at the risk of stepping in front of it, uh, <laughs> this is Miller. Uh, I do have one question that relates to uh, the section Michael talked about. I think we lost you. Yeah, the host muted me. I don't know why. I'm back. It was me. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a section in Michael's presentation, which <clears throat> uh, I think is going to be key to understanding this forward. Uh, we're talking about ISO 20022 and the DFSP IOP API coexisting in the system. And I think one of the, the things here is to understand whether we expect a mixed message environment or whether we expect that endpoints will be established for a particular use case on a on one type of message set or the other. A mixed message environment implies a number of things that are, may actually be eccentric to what we've already agreed to do. For example, end-to-end -end message signing for non-repudiation purposes will break if you try to switch message formats, unless you come up with a very careful um, structured way of identifying the signature agreement across the canonical data and you somehow encode that differently in ISO than you would code in DFSP IOP messages in a way that you can recompose those messages at the adapter boundaries without damaging that signature. I would have said trying to accomplish that is a little bit of science more than engineering <laughs> if at this point, and that it may be more difficult to do. Uh, but I would have said that what the way that you laid this out made sense to me if I, if I take for the moment the assumption that uh, I do need both kinds of messaging to be accommodated by the system, but I don't necessarily need heterogeneous messaging in a, com in a single transaction. And so I think there's some questions like that that don't immediately flow from the domain-driven design, primarily because I'm not sure that our level of requirements got quite to that level, which is, which is fine. We'll face those things as we come upon them. But I do think we should be careful not to overreach. Uh, I was very glad to see the timing that you had laid out for 
the uh, implementation, the completed implementation of the V2 architecture, meaning the core of this, uh, was the end of PI15, I think is what I saw on Pedro's slide. And so, for example, trying to solve this problem of a heterogeneous messaging across transaction types between now and the end of PI15 is uh, could consume mostly all of the oxygen that we have available to do this. <laughs> uh, I think though, otherwise this looks really good and I'm very pleased to see the way that you guys broke this down into these, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm afraid I don't know the terminology you're using for these yellow boxes, but uh, uh, yeah, the bounded contexts. There are, some, there are some other things too though that would also fit into this, I think in the new feature work. And it sounded to me, uh, Pedro, maybe you could clarify this, that we're, we're a new, requirement to form that looked like its own bounded context, there's an opportunity to experiment early on the core architecture we already have to think about those things through an eye towards having them arrive when the new architecture is ready, but that we don't yet have the, uh, say, uh, structure in place to do them that way. Now we start with the existing architecture uh, that suggests some factoring, but uh, is that was that what you were implying? So that you could start with kind of where you are to close some of the gaps. There was a, a version of this context map that showed some red, green, and so forth boxes that indicated the other gaps. Thank you. So there's some cases here where it's missing functionality that the team has identified as is critical to our customers, yeah. and that you're implying that within the context of the uh, domain-driven design, you've identified them, but that doesn't mean you have to wait until you have this architecture to close them. Did I understand that correctly? Because that, that feeds on my, my question around ISO. Yes. I'm sorry, I mean, that's a bit convoluted way of asking all of this, I apologize. No, that, that's fine. There's, there's lots of, of points there. I'm gonna leave the ISO uh, for, for someone else. I'm going to address the, um, the, the part where, of, of the process. Um, one of the important aspects of this is to identify, is to have that clear separation of concern, which is to say, we are grouping cohesive sets of functionality in, in bounded context, these yellow boxes. And then we are putting them with a nice and stable interface around it. What it means is that we can replace things, we can shift things around, and most importantly, we can extend our system by just understanding what exactly are those interfaces. Um, another thing that is important is that those things that are missing, some of the functionalities that are missing, we can implement them in, in phases. So we don't have to suffer that typical big long refactor problem, uh, which is until, it, until it's done, nothing can be released. The focus is getting the stable interfaces out. After that, we can start adding more functionality, obviously, assuming that those, inter those, those functionalities, they don't change the interfaces. So that, that's why that first phase, that first month is so important, is to get that solid understanding of what are the interfaces, what are the types of messages that we need to send out. After that, we can start changing things around because we have an expectation that those stable interfaces will be stable. So they will stay, we can, we can design for it, um, even if we want to do something for the current architecture, um, that's fine. Mm -hmm. We have a view of, what it will look like in the future. And that's going to give us a lot more guarantee. Well, that's great. And then, so the two, the two things then that pop from that one is relating to the ISO messaging. The, the, the goalpost has to be established up front as to whether or not you're looking at heterogeneous messaging and the form of which ISO will be supported. I, ISO is a schema, it's not a message. And so figuring out what forms of messages we will support and what the data dictionary that we would support would be in the early stages and how that fits into the domain-driven design strategy. Michael outlined already some things I hadn't thought about that uh, make it look like there's a formality there that we need to go through probably with the ISO community uh, to figure out what that mapping looks like. But then we have our own work to do to figure out, again, if we're doing heterogeneous messaging, how do we do it? If we're not, then how, what does the end-to-end -end look like for ISO? Um, and I'm noting in the comment that people have said, yeah, but what about Swift MT? I think that's kind of the same problem as well, that there's going to be interfaces for that. Uh, so 
that early on supporting of ISO would seem to me to be something that would have to come in um, uh, pr pretty early I, in this I can, process. So, so Pedro, um, you know, Pedro said uh, he would leave the ISO to someone else. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna partly answer, and then um, maybe Michael wants to add, and and I'll, I'll also point out that in exactly two and hours and 15 minutes, there's a whole session on ISO 222 that Michael okay. will present. So, so in terms of architecture though, I don't believe anyone uh, has any intention of supporting heterogeneous messaging. And, and just to clarify what I mean by that is, my understanding is as it stands, no one is expecting, for example, to send an ISO 222 message into the Modulib system and have the Modulib system send an FSP IOP message out the other side to the payee. Um, but we would like the Modulib system to support multiple formats of message. So if the pay, uh, if, if in a particular deployment environment, uh, the flavor of messaging that's used by all the participants is ISO 222. Modulib supports that. Okay. Um, so it wouldn't be a, it's not a, it's not a sort of message conversion. There's still, as you say, to, to you know, adhere to those end-to-end -end signing and so on. Um, it, it would need to be an agreement of format between the participants and Modulib can accommodate multiple of those is the, is the goal. I think Michael said it in the comments, but the, the primary goal here is make it really easy to deploy Modulib anywhere. Um, and then a secondary goal, which I think is an important one that Michael will build on in our presentation later is a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, they're being told they should move to 222. They are intending to, but what the 222 standard doesn't tell them is how to put the messages together for use cases. It doesn't say, you know, send this message, then expect this response, and the golden path looks like this, and the error path paths look like this. And I think what we have as an opportunity with Modulib is to define that for ISO 222 okay. and our use cases, and to say, if you use Modulib at the center and you want to use 222 as your message format, then this is how you do a P2P payment. This is how you do a merchant mm -hmm. request to pay. These are the messages to use. And so I think we have an opportunity in, in terms of how we take Modulib to market as not just we support 222, but we support you in deploying 222. This is really good. Thank you. And I can breathe easier now, knowing that you've <laughs> made the right choice on heterogeneity, that is to not support it. <laughs> Let's talk about the ISO thing then in your dedicated session. But it sounds like uh, you've got a pretty good plan for how that would work. The same thing then would apply to MT messaging, were that to be a requirement that would emerge, someone would define Fine. those things. And of course, the other thing yeah. to mention is that the platform technology companies defined FSP IOP as a dedicated and purpose-built API to support a set of 13 or so use cases that are unique to mobile money. And while they have, uh, they're not fully unique, in some of those cases, you can have a bank on the other end. You could even have two banks that use those same use cases. But it's, it's quite likely that uh, there will be some use cases that are very well explored and expressed in FSP IOP that will be very hard to represent in an ISO context, either because banks don't know how to do those things or because it wouldn't be meaningful for a bank to participate uh, in a particular kind of a flow uh, it, for a particular kind of scheme. But that comes to transaction design and is less important to the transfer of money through the system. As long as we have a strategy for saying, how do we get the mi minimum information out of the message that Mojaloop needs to clear and settle? Then the rest of it is transaction detail that we don't concern ourselves with. Uh, I, th I think then it sounds like uh, uh, you could support simultaneously multiple uh, API for or I should say multiple message formats. Yeah. If I think I understood you. Can I inject? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, that is a good understanding. And I, I don't want to steal Michael's thunder because I think he's got a lot on this, especially okay. thinking about, you know, our extended um, use cases like PISP as well. We, we, we will get into a lot more detail in the session later. Um, sorry, Brian, go ahead. So just one thought. I, I don't think the, the community or, or all of us collectively have um, have said specifically, we don't want to support mixed messaging. What we have said is there's not been a requirement for that. And when people have asked about things that weren't FSP IOP, it was in the context of, could we just all do this other thing? 
but there's an open question that I think is worth exploring. What clever thing can be done that gives us the exact same benefit as signing and never tampering with a message end to end to allow mixed messaging? And if that were achievable, then we could be more flexible there. And what might that open up? So it's the thing like we, it's really hasn't been explored or thought about because nobody's asked about it, but I don't think we should preclude it. So the point being that were we to look at end-to-end -end interledger guarantees uh, to protect the transaction integrity, then the message integrity becomes point-to-point -point between the switch and the sender, um, for example, and not end-to-end. -end. You get a different set of uh, guarantees, but you have to assemble them from different parts. Uh, whereas if we say, as we do now, using JWT or is it JW, I guess it's JWT, yeah. Uh, that we get a, uh, a message that is initiated by one counterparty, flows through the system untampered with and arrives at the endpoint, we can make their own uh, PKI-based um, uh, 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 ascertainment that that came from the right party, regardless of the fact that it, they got it from the switch. That end-to-end that -end guarantee, then we're getting two different forms of it. That's a good point, Brian, that we don't want to just say we're not going to do it, but that because we haven't faced it. But it also seems like it could be a quick pretty tall challenge. Yeah, the, uh, to the, try two, the two you know, kind of edges of that for me would be, well, if we once we start connecting schemes together, then mm -hmm. our ability to guarantee everybody's talking the same thing is diminished. And when we start really thinking about smaller schemes and inclusion, is it is it appropriate to force them all onto something like, you know, would the ISO thing have been chosen arbitrarily in this scheme initially because of its participants? And then when it wants to open to other participants, is that a challenge for them to move towards to all get on? And could we just solve that by having, you know, multiple ins and outs essentially? And it, I think it's worth thinking about. I agree with that. I think there's also work we could ask the FSP IOP experts to think about too, which is, is, is there anything within their uh, design architecture for the API that uh, would be relevant to restating portions of that stack on an ISO base rather than on the, uh, the base that they've used? I, I don't know, I, I suspect not, but it might be worth also looking there uh, but anyway, I, I, I just wanted to be sure there was a way to look at that uh, a little bit more deeply as we go forward. And did um, something Michael says- Mr. Uh, Richards. Uh, Michael, Michael said something interesting in the past, which is that the, the hub already has to understand the intent of the message and, and really all participants do. And I think the, the whole point of this end-to-end -end guarantee is to, is to be, um, uh, be sure that you know, party A intended for something to happen and everybody along the way knows both party A said that, asserted that, and this is what that thing meant. Uh, and that's really the part of the problem with the hub regenerating uh, a different form of a message is then it's to some level, the hub is on the hook for uh, screwing up the intent um, when, whenever, whenever it does that. But if there's a way with signing to say, everybody has a universal understanding of intent, that is not relying on the entire encoding of a message being wrapped up in something, then, then we can be more flexible, I think. And that's, that's what I was getting at, is whether we're really trying to bite that off. Uh, it, it sounds like that's, that wouldn't be an initial goal, but it's not necessarily written off. So um, I've, made a, I've made it the principle of life, never to contra contradict Brian, uh, but I'm gonna come close to it. Um, <laughs> Though it's always served me well in the past, I have to say. Um, to say we have done a bit of thinking about this. It's, uh, thinking is in its early stages. As, as everybody has said, our initial proposal is that we should provide different forms of messaging per scheme and that we shouldn't support multiple messaging in the scheme. But what we're thinking at the moment is that if we did need to provide heterogeneous message formats for a scheme, then a way in which that might work is for the switch to provide a central canonicalization service, which everybody would use in order to retrieve a canonicalized version of the message they received, which would enable them to compare it with 
the uh, signed version of the message that was sent. Well, it's an interesting idea. I, I, I want to be careful not to introduce <laughs> a requirement. Miller, that's though. Miller speak for rubbish, isn't it? Uh, uh, no, no, I, no I, I hear what you're saying. And I think, look, a can canonical agreement is in fact the core of what you're saying. And I, that I agree with. I think that's the core point here is, is that different? ISO doesn't agree with that, right? ISO says the message is what it is and I signed it. And if you modified it, then, it's, then the message is no longer any good. So what we're saying is, to get away from that, for heterogeneity to make sense, you would have to have a canonical form. Um, you know, if I had to pick any bone, it would only be whether I had to ask the switches uh, to do this for me, or whether I had some way of doing it myself because it was specified how it would be done. And that comes down to how many moving parts are there in a scheme system that have to get the thing right. Uh, it's certainly doing it once is better than doing it, you know, 50 times, one bank each doing their own. But if the SDK did this, for example, it's something that I don't have to ask the center to do it for me. That's another round trip that I'd rather avoid if there were some way to do it or simply have it encoded in the message properly in the first place. Yeah, but it's the way uh, all of those things would... works now, isn't it? Yeah, well, well you just so said this, this is the canonicalization service that I intend to use. Not exactly. So for JSON uh, canonicalization, it's done by writing it down. People say you sort based alphabetically on the you know, for headers in the, um, the, the HTTP headers be sorted alphabetically. These are the ones you include. These are the ones that are not included. Once you put them in the right order, these are to be uppercase, lowercase, et cetera. Having done all of that, you then apply the hash to it and then you sign the hash. So whatever the, 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 the process is, it's well described. And having done that, then you anybody can form the canonical version of the message, regardless of what happened to it, how it was mangled by a router along the way. Uh, and you don't have to go ask somebody else's permission for it, uh, especially in a case where it's just going to get mangled anyway. Uh, you, you're not going to get the definitive answer. So I, I think canonicalization could be separate as a tool for figuring this out. Uh, I think Brian's core point was, I don't think we've actively said we don't have the requirement for heterogeneity. Uh, and But I, I, I'm concerned about what that implies if we go down that passing, it's a requirement when it didn't actually emerge as one. What we know is banks want to talk ISO. Uh, the mobile money platforms would like to use FSPIOP. We're trying to get them together to where a bank can talk to a mobile money operator. That implies we've at least thought about the question of heterogeneity uh, it, or we're going to imply that somebody has to do something unnatural on their side. I, probably, maybe we could leave that for the ISO session though and pick this up again when we get to that. Um, I, hardly right. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I guess at the end, I'm sorry, Simeon's probably uh, breathing down our necks here to get us going. Uh, the one thing that I would like to be careful about is that we understand the uh, resourcing that's required to activate this V2 architecture plan. And what I heard was that it, it would be a rolling progress system. That is, you start where you are and start closing domain-driven designed gaps in the system on the plan that you have. But one of the big things that we have that's open is the, uh, is the system of record. And I think that uh, there was a title in here that included the word tiger beetle, that the presumption is that there's been some study here to look at how tiger beetle could become that high performance system of record. Uh, and that requires some changes to the existing architecture uh, to, to be most relevant uh, to that plan. Did you guys didn't talk much about that here? Is there a separate session to go into that? No, that that was sorry. I, I breezed over that for really for time. Uh, I mean, what it boiled down to was uh, it's going to be very difficult to integrate Tiger Beetle as a system of record into the current architecture, and and so we are pouring most of our efforts into helping progress this new architecture design as fast as possible. Um, and that the accounts and balances bounded context would be where Tiger Beetle fits in. Um, so Tiger Beetle's development work is continuing on in parallel. That's, that's unaffected. Um, so Donovan and, and Joran continue to work on that. But from my side, um, you know, working on the design proposal, um, we're shifting focus to be focused on the reference architecture work primarily with a view to that enabling us to do take ownership of the accounts and balances bound a context and proposing a way that Tiger Beetle would form a, the, the key system of record there.
Were, were you able to kind of validate that the accounts and balances bounded context was sufficient for Tiger Beetle to exist? That's, that's our assumption. Um, we need to be clear on what those interfaces will be. But yes, the, the assumption is that it will. Uh, it will also depend on um, somewhat on what settlement models we use. So if we go for a, for example, continuous gross settlement model, uh, we need to think about what happens in the settlement bounded context and how that impacts accounts and balances, where there's some functionality that we would expect to be drawn out of accounts and balances into settlement um, actually necessarily is inside Tiger Beetle and, and happens inside that. Uh, so you would you'd have to split that into the settlements bounded context being more of a management and configuration piece, but the actual execution against transactions was actually happening inside Tiger Beetle. But we, we're not at that level of detail yet because um, we, I think, still need to define the interfaces to those bound, those different bounded contexts. Just, just to wrap um, up, one of the objectives is to have those components um, with the ability to be replaceable. So if we can get to that nice, good future, then everything is, is, is it, as it is really. Um, I, Simin, I, I know you're, you're pushing us out. Thank you for your attention. Um, we all hope that you're excited, uh, as excited as we are with this new vision for the, for the architecture V2. And again, thank you for everyone that participated in the sessions. Um, it's been really difficult, but uh, a pleasure to work with, with all this great. Yeah, it, it, I want to add a key is please make sure you're part of the planning sessions tomorrow. Yeah. I think that's where we will start to really come our way with a work plan for the next steps. Um, so let's, yeah, make sure you're involved in those tomorrow, please. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, I will urge everybody to jump on to the next session with KSP, which has just begun.